Hey there YouTube, good afternoon. This is meteorologist Hunter Anderson and I want to do a little bit of a forecast discussion for tomorrow's severe weather threat valid March 31st, 2023. I wrote a few notes down. I'm going to go over some things pretty quickly. I know we all have pretty short attention spans and there's so much to talk about even just with one generic mid-latitude cyclone from a meteorology perspective. Uh, however, I'm going to be mostly focusing on the severe convective side of things, in more particular, the northern mode of the severe potential. I'm not really going to be touching on the southern mode, which is going to be focused seemingly across eastern Arkansas into northern Mississippi, western Tennessee, Kentucky. I'm sure I'm going to miss some things too. I apologize. Again, I'm just going to be spitting out what I've been seeing over the last few days. And what I honestly think is going to happen tomorrow based off of personal experience and knowledge from forecasting, at least professionally, the last three to four years, and forecasting as a storm chaser for the last nine years. This is going to be my 10th year storm chasing, and I do plan on chasing tomorrow somewhere in eastern Iowa. We'll get into that in a little bit. But this will be my first chase since the last day of the Twisted Sky Tours. Tour 1 last year ran from late May into early June. So this will be my first chase really since June 4th when we were in Nebraska. I'm getting excited. All right, let's get into it. And what I have shown here is the mid-level water vapor imagery. This is from GOES 16 Band 09. And the two main features I really want to focus on real quick we have a pretty broad region of ridging. I'm not sure if the screencast will pick the mouse up, but we have a pretty broad area of ridging across the central and eastern conus with our large scale trough coming into the coast of California and the Great Basin. But this feature is going to make its way east across the central continental United States and eventually into the northeast United States over the coming days. So we're going to work our way from the top to the bottom. All right, we're going to be looking at the atmosphere at roughly the 250 millibar level and we're going to work our way down to the surface over the next number of minutes. We're going to watch the evolution of this trough as it progresses again from the western conus all the way into the central conus. Now by 21z tomorrow, some things I want to point out here as we go back and forth. But look how amplified this pattern is currently. Pretty amplified pattern. And our subtropical ridging extends all the way up into the Gulf of Mexico. But that ridging pattern still exists all the way up into the Great Lakes where we seem to have a, a region of upper level confluence as well. But we have our jet streak across the Great Lakes, anticyclonically curved at the peak of that ridge. And then as we move forward with time, watch how this trough across the western conus gradually de-amplifies while strengthening. We have a pretty solid corridor of 140 to 160 knot winds right around jet level. That's very intense. And knowing from jet streak dynamics, we know that the left exit region of this jet streak, which is located over eastern Iowa, southwest Wisconsin, somewhere in there, that's where we're going to have a lot of upper level divergence. So what's that going to do to really the entire atmosphere below this level? Okay, the atmosphere is going to want to fill that up. It's going to want to find a ton of mass from down below and then essentially fill up that column so that it can eject all that mass outward up at the jet level. So what's that going to look like, say, at 500 millibars? Ideally, we would expect a strengthening system when we see this. We see a 5,460 meter height level. And as we move forward with time, we start to see contours of lower and lower heights make their way across the mid-Missouri River Valley. And it looks like by about 4 to 5 p.m. this low 
is going to be about as strong as it will be before it begins the occluding process with that low centered rate across, you know, Yankton, South Dakota, give or take 30 miles or so. Really strong differential cyclonic vorticity advection. It's going to be located across Iowa, Minnesota, Missouri. Now our forcing further south isn't going to be as strong. However, our heights still do continue to fall throughout the day. So the deeper layer forcing isn't going to necessarily be there. However, other components from the system will still favor gradual growth of supercells and likely tornadic supercells down south. However, the forcing is going to be most strong here across Iowa as the system progresses eastward with time. Looking at our mid-level jet, you'll see this reference in the SBC outlook too. We're looking at 100 to 120 knots, 500 millibar flow from Oklahoma pointing into Illinois. This is a pretty rare kinematic space, but something that is ideally more typical during springtime systems such as this. But I don't want to disregard how rare this mid-upper level kinematic space is, especially when you overlay this over a ton of low-level moisture. Looking at temperature across Iowa during the afternoon tomorrow at 500 millibars, we have a, a pretty broad area of minus 20 or cooler temperatures. They're nosing their way into southeast Minnesota, southwest Wisconsin, northeast Missouri, and into northwest Illinois. Now, when you think about minus 20 Celsius at 500 millibars, it's approximately six kilometers up above the ground. And when we have our 925 millibar temperatures right around 20 C, that's a 40 degree Celsius difference from roughly 500 meters, 750 meters to six kilometers. Uh, you are cooling with height. You have fairly steep lapse rates at that point. We are going to have buoyancy present across this area. Continue to move on down to 700 millibars. This is where things get a little more, this is where a little more finer scale details uh, start to emerge. Looking at maybe potential embedded short waves in this perturbed flow. So move through a time. Uh, we'll start off at 7Z. So this is pretty early Friday morning, right after midnight tonight. I see a pretty uniform dip in the geopotential height contours, as well as an increase in isotax across Arkansas, Missouri, and Iowa. This is likely an embedded shortwave that is going to continue moving northeast up into the Great Lakes right around daybreak. We'll see a pretty good response from this shortwave promoting a widespread precip activity, I would think. Do we see anything else going on behind this? We actually see a little bit of shortwave ridging forming behind that lead trough. And this is going to be important as we go into late Friday morning. I'm curious to see if there is going to be a actually decent clearing in the wake of whatever morning activity moves through throughout the late morning and into the early afternoon. This ridging may temper cloud cover and precip during that time. However, as we look at the relative humidity and, and potential moisture in the mid-levels throughout the morning, here is 8 a.m. Friday, central time, 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11. Now, I see a plume of increased moisture here across Arkansas and Missouri that's going to continue spreading northeast within that strong southwest flow. If this is going to lead to thick cloud cover, I'm not sure how well we're going to be able to destabilize in the wake of this given only maybe two to three hours before that Pacific front comes through and the strong forcing moves through. However, look how much clearer Iowa is, eastern Iowa, southeast Minnesota, southwest Wisconsin. We'll move forward with time going on into the afternoon. This region still stays fairly clear. Now, northeast Missouri finally clears out at 1, 2 o'clock, and this is according to the wrap. We'll continue to move forward with time, and we see that clearing now evident across western Illinois. But I would think by this point, our Pacific front's already going to be firing up con deep convection. I'm not sure how well the wrap can resolve that at this point. I know it's a little bit broader scale in terms of grid spacing, but um, 
the one thing I really want to mention is, I mean, at one o'clock, if we have this much cloud cover or potential precip, some type of weak convective cluster, uh, cloud debris, whatever you want to call it, moving through the mid-Mississippi Valley, moving up into Illinois, this could, uh, we could get a repeat, say, of March 28, 2020, where most of the tornadic activity is more confined to the immediate triple point and surface low pressure. Uh, meanwhile, Illinois gets spared from most of the event and the potential more destructive tornadoes given the parameter space. One of my favorite parameters to look at when I analyze models, guys, is the 850 millibar theta E. I love looking for moisture tongues in this. I love looking for gradients. Nine times out of ten, this tells me where I need to go. And I'm not saying it needs to tell you where to go, but nine times out of ten, this tells me where to go. A good indication that the environment will be supportive of at least severe convection is if your values are roughly around or above 330 Kelvin. We'll look at the broad warm sector valid 7 a.m. Friday. Pretty broad warm sector here, demarcated by that 325 to roughly 330 Kelvin mark. As we move forward with time, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, we'll see our better moisture, at least at the 850 millibar level, starts to thin out a little bit. We have a narrow corridor ahead of this Pacific front. But look how strong these winds are. These 45 to 60 knot winds are going to be transporting this juicy moisture all the way northward up into the Midwest. As I hover this crosshair around eastern Iowa, southwest Wisconsin, northwest Illinois, I mean, we do get to that 330 Kelvin mark. Let's see if we can get a little bit more clear, defined theta E tongue and or pinched off point as we move lower down to the 925 millibar level. We'll get right to around midday. Here's 1 o'clock. Really deep moisture down here across Texas, Louisiana, into Arkansas. 335 to 340 Kelvin. That's plenty deep uh, for any, any type of severe weather, no matter what time of year. Uh, however, as we move further north, we start to get a little bit more well-defined axis of this higher theta E values. Still get to around 330 Kelvin in eastern Iowa. And a pretty good axis, pretty good point. It looks like a, the tip of a triangle. There's a corner here. There is a pinch going on here. This is where I like to target personally. And anecdotally speaking, this is where majority of tornadoes occur too. Whether they're photogenic, visible, strong, damaging, weak, whatever. This is where a lot of tornado activity typically is found near that surface low, right at the northern axis and gradient of the theta E tongue beneath and ahead of the really strong mid to upper level forcing. And this air is quite anomalous for this time of year too. 330 to 335 Kelvin across the mid to maybe even uh, upper Mississippi River Valley. This is a pretty rare amount of moisture, especially this early in spring. This is something we would typically see more uh, later in spring into early summer. So an anomalous air mass will be present across the area, uh, ready to fire up storms at will. And next I want to look at the high resolution ensemble forecast via the Storm Prediction Center website. I want to take a look at really the ensemble mean for dew point temperatures. Now, sometimes in these more anomalous systems, I've, I've seen these values become underdone. And a good example would be last year during the winter set Iowa event on March 5th. I think the HREF and the HER only had dew points getting up into the upper 50s in southwest Iowa. But by 2 to 3 p.m., I noticed multiple sites reporting 61 to 63 dew point temperatures. And... If we remained in the upper 50s, I'm not quite sure that event would have been as robust. So we're talking on the order of a couple degrees of, of dew point temperature, of air temperature, could make or break events like this too. It's, it's just crazy how all this needs to, this entire system needs to work cohesively in order for it to reach its 
full ceiling or potential. Anyways, one thing I want to note, watch, watch this stream. We're, we're going to look at two things here. Watch this stream of moisture continuing to advect northward and watch these isobars across the Missouri Valley. Watch these continue to tighten and continue to drop. Again, this is a response to that really strong forcing aloft, that strengthening mid-level shortwave and the upper-level shortwave, that left exit region of that jet streak. All things point to a deepening surface low. And as you see right where my cursor is, you see a, a new contour developed there in western Iowa. And this continues to broaden, and we continue to get another lower pressure mark. 988 millibars at the surface. This system continues to deepen and strengthen throughout the day tomorrow. That is a little bit alarming in terms of a more robust severe weather event. These are the types of events that will possess the opportunities of long track supercells with really strong tornadoes. This is the case just this past Friday down in Mississippi. This was the case December 10th with that quad state tornado. I, this, this is the case with a lot of these events. We have these deepening low pressures, strong moisture advection ahead of that. When you get a combination of those two, this typically leads to widespread severe weather outbreaks, including destructive tornadoes and, and plenty of them. Uh, so based off the kind of more smoothed ensemble forecast, it looks like we have an 888 millibar low pressure centered in northeast Iowa with its Pacific front draped across the really the tri-state border of Illinois, Iowa, and Missouri, and then it extends back southwestward into western Arkansas and east Texas. The warm front is going to be situated roughly across southern Wisconsin. This is also alarming. If we get a cell to move somewhere in the more open, moist sector, if you will, latch onto that warm front, we can get very well uh, a robust tornadic supercell along that warm front somewhere in northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin. This is also a very possible idea we need to exercise. I also know that uh, our Great Lakes are pretty cold this time of year, so I would be quite surprised if we can get quite this uh, degree of moisture return northward across Lake Michigan. Uh, I would think there may be a little bit of a temperature uh, inversion or There'd be a, a differential temperature boundary somewhere inland here um, across northeast Illinois and, and eastern Wisconsin. So that is also something to watch. Not sure if that may influence constructively or destructively ongoing severe convection as the system makes its way into southern Wisconsin later into tomorrow night. Here's our most unstable K parcel and overlaid are the 0 to 6 kilometer or otherwise known as deep layer wind vectors. All right, so we are connecting the point of the hodograph from literally the ground or from roughly <laughs> 10 meters up to the point in the hodograph that represents the wind at six kilometers. We make a direct line, we make a direct vector from those two points, connect them, and it's also going to have magnitude. How strong is it? Well, we have pretty strong magnitude of zero to six kilometer shear present across the across an unstable sector, across the moist sector, whatever you want to call it. I mean, our instability is here in our purples, blues, and greens, and our vectors are showing up here with these wind barbs. And you're seeing flags because we're looking at deep layer shear vectors in excess of 50 to 60 knots, and that's pretty strong, and that, although it is more typical this time of year, on the grand scheme of things, that's pretty strong. Another thing we want to look at is the orientation of these vectors to our forcing. Now, this chart does a really good job outlining our kind of our regions of forcing, our surface fronts. We have our dry line here extending back into Texas, uh, or cold front, whatever you want to call it. We have our low pressure somewhere up here in western Iowa, uh, and we have our warm front up here. Uh, or at least our, our elevated warm front, our 850 millibar warm front up here across Minnesota into northern Wisconsin. We have our surface warm front probably in these deeper greens and aqua colors across southern Minnesota. It's probably where our surface warm front is 
is lifting to according to the latest wrap today. Uh, and looking at these vectors, if these vectors are parallel to these boundaries that I just mentioned, it's going to favor more of an upscale growth to convection. It's not going to favor more isolated discrete convection. The more 90 degrees these vectors are to those boundaries, to those sources of forcing, if you will, the likelihood of discrete convection increases immensely. In fact, I, I mean, it, I don't think I've ever seen a case where these deep layer shear vectors are more or are 90 degrees off this boundary and storms grow up scale immediately, barring very weak uh, mid and upper level shear and really strong downdrafts. Anyways, uh, these vectors are appearing a little bit more, let's zoom in actually. We are blessed by uh, College of DuPage. They have set up a sector view right across the northern mode for severe weather tomorrow. Uh, looking at about, let's go to, let's go to two o'clock. So these vectors here along this instability gradient are fairly parallel. They follow that gradient pretty well. We would rather see vectors a little bit more orthogonal or perpendicular crossing this gradient as opposed to essentially riding along this gradient. Not the same can necessarily be said further north, however. So these vectors are a little bit more perpendicular up here across north central Iowa. Now, of course, we have our open moist sector here, uh, and these vectors seem to turn a little bit more to the right as well. So it's just something to think about, something that led me yesterday to believing there's a decent chance we get quick upscale growth into a tornadic QLCS up across northern and northeast Iowa if these vectors remain more parallel to that forcing. Zooming in here quick on the 925 millibar theta E, looking at, we'll focus this right at, at 3 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, again, here's our broad warm sector, cold front, dry line, whatever you want to call it at this point, marching its way through Missouri and Iowa, connecting to our low pressure. Our 925 low appears to be a little bit offset to the northwest, which is fine. Our surface low is going to be a little bit further east. Uh, that also indicates pretty good uh, barrow clinity uh, with this system. Our winds begin to back right along this warm front, uh, remain fairly southerly here too, right at the nose of this 330 Kelvin, uh, 332 Kelvin gradient. Um, our, our pinch point looks to be right across far southeast Minnesota. We're looking at right around the Austin area. If you drew a straight line from Austin to La Crosse, somewhere in there, that's, that's a pretty good pinch point in my opinion. So, that's a very possible target area, would be Austin to La Crosse. Now, unfortunately, the terrain, as you get closer to the Mississippi River, is terrible. Um, but I know the terrain out near Austin, Minnesota, eastward for, say, 60 miles or so, pretty good, fairly chaseable, in my opinion. Uh, the other area to watch would be this warm front across southern Wisconsin, uh, not very chaseable within the Wisconsin River Valley. You're going to have to pick and choose your battles out here. I mean, Madison, rush hour, you're not going to want to chase around that city between 3.30 and 6 p.m. So you're going to be uh, poop out of luck, if you will. Uh, however, further south, across southeast Iowa into northwest Illinois, again, you're going to have to worry about your river crossings. Train's a little bit more flat, uh, fairly chaseable. You just need to commit to one side of the river or the other. Um, but just looking at 925 millibar theta E, I mean, these are the three targets I'm kind of eyeballing right now. The triple point right here at the pinch point of this theta E tongue, the warm front further east, roughly a hundred miles or so, um, or maybe something a little more open sector, uh, open moist sector off that surging dry line, uh, kind of right along the Mississippi river there. All right, let's look at some soundings across those areas. So this sounding is valid 4 p.m. near the town of Decorah, Iowa. I love what I'm seeing from the low-level thermodynamics. You can see our 0 to 3 kilometer mean layer Kate value is 184 joules per kilogram. That's plenty of low-level stretching to get any type of vorticity 
stretching into an updraft, into a strong updraft? Are we going to have a strong updraft with this sounding? Looking at our hodograph, I would say our mid-level updraft can certainly be strong. Uh, however, our low-level uh, presumed <laughs> mesocyclone isn't going to necessarily be this strong. We do have, I would say, a, a modest storm relative flow vector into this uh, low-level wind, assuming right motion. Uh, however, look at our 0 to 1 kilometer vector. It's fairly weak. We're looking at right around 15 knots or so. Uh, 14 here according to the sharp high sounding. Uh, our low-level hodograph does not support robust low-level updrafts across that that favored, in my personal favored, pinch point near that, out and ahead of that triple point. Um, however, really strong mid-level flow. I mean, one kilometer, we have 25 knots out of the southwest. Up to six kilometers, we're 70 knots out, still out of the southwest. Unidirectional shear, so that's going to favor either mirror-imaged supercells uh, with a primarily a damaging wind threat, but also worried about large hail with this sounding too, given the really strong mid-level shear and a fairly deep, a fairly deep layer of instability too. So uh, our equilibrium levels usually don't get up to around, say, 10, 11 kilometers uh, this early in the season, but with how robust the system is, we're going to get some pretty tall cape. Uh, and speaking of CAPE in general, I mean, 3,000 surface-based CAPE, you know, give or take three, 500 joules per kilogram. I mean, this is a rare thermodynamic space across this area this early in the year. This is rare. I cannot stress that enough. Um, now, I know the potential hazard type says tornado. I do not expect tornadoes necessarily given this hodograph. I would expect more of a damaging wind threat and a large hail threat initially. And one more thing I wanted to note. I did make a, a tweet about this yesterday, but talking about alternations in the hodograph, especially within the effective inflow layer. Our effective inflow layer is marked by this cyan whisker plot down here and stretches from roughly the surface to about 1.75 kilometers above the ground. It's a pretty deep effective inflow layer, and that's also marked on the hodograph within this, these blue lines here. All this space from these cyan lines to the hodograph, that is our effective inflow layer storm relative helicity. One thing I want to note is look at this alternation in the hodograph. We get a little bit of veering here, and then we actually back, and this is still included in that deep effective inflow layer. I wanted to make a note about this because alternations in the hodograph in terms of concavity will suppress right moving updrafts. So if we have this alternation being realized tomorrow across that pinch point in northeast Iowa, southeast Minnesota, maybe far western Wisconsin, again this also I would think should limit right moving supercells and therefore better tornado potential. Let's move a little further southeast along the warm front into the Madison area. This is Madison, Wisconsin, roughly around rush hour at around 4 p.m. This is right along the warm front. Of course, we'll see how things evolve throughout the day. There may be some morning convection that reinforces that boundary further south. It may lift up further north. I honestly haven't looked at the snowpack across southern Wisconsin. Uh, but I do know they recently got some pretty heavy snow in the last week, so I'm sure that's also going to play a major influence on this. But just strictly looking at the hodograph here, this makes me a little bit more concerned. Pretty good hump in the lowest 1 to 2 kilometers, and this effective inflow layer doesn't include this alternation in the hodograph within 2 to 3 kilometers, where we have that alternating concavity. So this would more ideally favor right moving supercells, and an enlarging 0 to 1 kilometer shear vector and resulting enlarging low-level storm relative helicity, this would favor more of a tornado threat with any supercell in the afternoon. And as you can see here, our winds right at the surface are slightly backed. Granted, they are weak. However, weaker low-level winds will impart greater shear 
and a greater shear vector on the hodograph. If this low level wind was say 15 to 20 knots, similar to that wind another couple hundred meters above, this vector is going to shorten significantly and therefore going to result in a much weaker low level shear. Let's move on south toward the Davenport area. Again, love this, love this low level thermodynamic profile. We have deep moisture and we continue to cool with height and that's going to give off a ton of low level instability when our low is three kilometers. If our three kilometer line is roughly here, I mean look at all this positive space down here. That's huge for low level stretching. Unfortunately, Looking at this hodograph, this is a fairly straight hodograph again, similar to what we were seeing up in northeast Iowa. So this would again favor more mirror image supercells, left and right splits. And even if a storm were to split to the right, there's still not a whole lot of streamwise vorticity being ingested into the low level mesocyclone if there is one. So a fairly straight hodograph. This is going to favor primarily a damaging wind threat and then probably a hail threat second before we even think about tornadoes. As we move on further south, this is closer toward, this is between Keokuk, Iowa, and St. Louis. Again, look at this large hump and a much larger vector in that zero to one kilometer layer. In my opinion, this would favor more of a long track uh, tornado risk with its parent supercell. A really strong shear throughout a deep layer. I mean, we're gonna have robust updrafts regardless of whether they're, they favor tornadoes or not. Again, deep, low-level moisture, and then we cool off pretty well, uh, right above one, one and a half kilometers. It's going to contribute to, again, 169, 190 plus zero to three kilometer mixed layer cape. In addition, our storm relative inflow winds are going to be cranking. And we're looking at roughly 50 to 55 knots assuming right motion with these storms, 50 to 55 knots of storm relative inflow. This is going to lead to very large bases for thunderstorms, which are also favorable for hail. However, given this robust low-level hodograph shape, I would think this would favor more uh, potentially wedge-type tornadoes and long-track steady-state low-level mesocyclones. The brief point I'm going to mention about the southern mode uh, and why there is a moderate down there as well. Now granted our thermodynamics perhaps don't necessarily look that tremendous, right? Not as much cooling below and that's because we have such deep moisture. When we have those downdrafts occurring in the rear flank, tornadoes typically form when that, that low level temperature isn't as drastic in that rear flank downdraft. Tornadoes typically form in those robust supercells if that rear flank downdraft air is much more moist and warmer than they are if they're colder and drier. If they are colder and drier, that's going to lead to greater negative buoyancy and therefore likely lead to more RFD surges and more of a wind damaging threat than anything or more, more brief tornadoes or transient tornadoes. However, looking at this hodograph, this is around the Memphis area tomorrow evening, uh, that is again very robust uh, curvature uh, of roughly 30 to 40 knots in the 0 to 1 kilometer layer. All I'm seeing is a veering within the effective inflow layer. This is going to favor right moving supercells uh, capable of, of strong tornadoes. And looking at the latest day 2 SBC outline, you can see why they want to highlight that region right around the Memphis area. And this is the latest day two outlook now. This was released about an hour ago. Uh, I know we had initially these two modes across north and south. I know Elizabeth Leitman was, was fairly vocal about this on social media, how we're going, to, we're going to likely see a bimodal distribution of severe reports and of, of supercells and severe weather tomorrow. And this is likely going to be the case. We have uh, that more subtle forcing further south, but the deeper moisture, not as deep of moisture, but still plenty deep right near the surface low with steeper lapse rates and really strong shear and forcing aloft. So that's kind of contributing to our two major uh, 
well, two major but at the same time separate modes of severe weather. Still favorable for for tornadoes. I would think the stronger tornado risk, if any EF2 pluses were to occur, I think would, would be more confined down toward the Memphis area, up towards St. Louis, potentially up across central and northern Illinois. I would think uh, if there would be numerous tornadoes, more, uh, however, weaker in strength, put air quotes around weaker. I know there's a lot of debate about that, but um, more EF0 to EF1 type tornadoes, I would think would be more confined to the surface though, but there'd be a lot more of them than say the amount of tornadoes that would occur down further south or near that Ohio River and Mississippi Valley confluence. Uh, hail was upgraded uh, to a 30% hatch now. Uh, it was a 15% with that little hatch area up there. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, with those, that really strong mid-level shear, that is indicative of uh, robust mid-level mesocyclones and uh, favors larger hail growth. Wind as well remains a 45%. And I believe the tornado risk was upgraded across eastern Iowa. Yeah, so we have that 15% now. Earlier in the day, we just had that 10%. Um, I probably went way over the time I said I was going to, uh, but those are my initial thoughts for the day tomorrow. Uh, as it comes to targeting a potential area, uh, take a look at Google Maps here. Let's go, we'll go into the actual map layer, not satellite. By definition, that is technically not a map. So again, we have that pinch point here with the low-level theta E tongue up here uh, north of Waterloo. We have that warm front play across southwest and the south central Wisconsin. Or we have the, you know, hope for something along the, or ahead of the strongly forced cold front slash dry line into southeast Iowa, western, northwest Illinois. Um, right now I'm leaning the immediate triple point still just because of the degree of surface vorticity that I know is going to be present and all of that low-level stretching that's going to be present up in this area. It is, there is a strong signal on all models for that to occur up here. And when you have a really good overlap of that surface vorticity and low-level stretching defined by the really high values of zero to three kilometer instability, I mean, that's almost a no-brainer you want to target that then, if you, even if you get a, a, a weaker updraft. But I think the more robust potential, uh, anything stronger, long-tracked, I think would be south of Davenport, uh, somewhere out between Galesburg to uh, Galesburg, Quincy, somewhere out here. Again, I, the hodographs here seem to be favoring more of a, a mirror imaging supercell wind damage threat, but the hodographs just, you know, 100 miles further south, uh, Galesburg, Quincy, Peoria, up into this region of northern Illinois, I mean, right along the, I believe that's the Illinois River, I would think would favor more robust supercells and long track tornado potential. Uh, I'm torn between, I grew up in the Madison area. I spent my first 21 years of life there. As, as tempting, as tempting as that target is right near the warm front, I don't know if I, want to be there and actually see something go through that area. Um, that's personal choice. Um, I like how close this is to the Minneapolis area, this northern target right along the triple point. Um, but again, as for robust, destructive tornadoes or longer track tornadoes, again, I I'm not rooting for that. I would like to see a tornado of that stature at some point. I don't, I haven't seen that yet, but I don't want to see towns getting destroyed. Absolutely not. That is, that's freaking horrible. But I don't think that's going to be the case up here in, in Northeast Illinois, Southeast Minnesota. Um, again, I think that threat's going to be a little bit stronger, a little bit higher, Galesburg, Quincy, and, and points Northeastward. I hope that made sense. That's all I have for you. Thanks for watching. I'm continuing to work my butt off on this little documentary, if you will, of my first year being a Storm Chase Tour Guide with Twisted Sky Tours last year. And that should come out here hopefully in the next month, month and a half before our tour starts up in, uh, in, in late May. So with that said, again, guys, thanks for watching. Have a blessed rest of your day. 
and we'll see where we target tomorrow. I hope I picked the right area. God bless.